Hello, this is the section 1.2 lesson. In this section, we state some basic concepts and definitions related to probability. First of all, probability deals with describing what we call random experiments. Uh, a random experiment is an activity in which the result is not known until the activity is performed. Now, the words activity and result we leave as undefined. Now, most everything in life is a random experiment. If you think about it, uh, just about everything in life, you don't know exactly what's going to happen until you actually do it. And uh, so, therefore, uh, probability has applications to uh, a wide range of uh, real life uh, applications. Now, informally, probability is a measure of how likely something is to occur. Now, that is not at all a formal mathematical definition of probability, and in fact, we're not even going to define the idea of probability, but this gives us at least a, a, a conceptual starting point. Okay. Num uh, probabilities are numbers that take value between 0 and 1. Okay. Now, definition 1, 1, 2, 1, we introduce uh, uh, three, uh, three, three words. First of all, an outcome is a result of a random experiment. So it's just a really another name for a result. Okay. Number two, the sample space of a random experiment is the set of all possible outcomes. And then third, an event is, the, is a subset of the sample space. So we see a lot of words here like set and subset, and that indicates that set theory is going to form a foundation for a lot of what we do in probability. And that is the case in next section. We'll get more into that. Now, some notation, um, events are subsets of sample space, and we typically denote them by capital letters. And we typically use letters from the first half of the alphabet, like A, B, C, D, etc. Uh, and then a symbol like P of A uh, denotes the probability of event A occurring. We're going to see notations like this um, a lot. So now we're going to talk about three ways of calculating probabilities. Uh, you're probably somewhat all, all familiar with these. Uh, the first is what we call a relative frequency approximation. And when you think about probability, this may be kind of the idea of what you're thinking about. So it says to estimate the probability of an event A, repeat the random experiment several times. Each repetition is called a trial. And then count the number of times the event occurred. Okay, so then the probability of A is approximately equal to the number of times the event occurred divided by the number of trials. And this fraction on the right is called a relative frequency. Okay, so this idea is pretty simple. It just means you repeat the experiment uh, over and over, count the number of times the event occurred, divide that by the number of trials, and you get an approximation of the probability of that event. That's important to remember that this is an approximation, and we'll illustrate why that is the case here in a bit. Okay. Uh, another approach is what we call the theoretical approach. Um, and this says, if all outcomes of the random experiment are equally likely, S is the finite sample space, and A is an event, then the probability of A equals N of A divided by N of S, where N and A and N of S are the number of elements in those sets A and S, respectively. Okay. So this uh, doesn't require us to repeat the experiment over and over again. All it, need, all it requires us to do is to count the number of elements in the sample space, count the number of elements in the event, divide the two, and we're all done. Okay. And this is going to give us an exact value. It's not an approximation. But there's two very important qualifiers here. First of all, all the outcomes have to be equally likely. And then second, the sample space has to be finite. If either of those conditions is not met, then we can't use this approach to calculate a probability. Okay. Uh, next, let's talk about a, a law that relates these two approaches. It's called the law of large numbers. And this says that as the number of trials gets larger, the relative frequency approximation of the probability of A gets closer to the theoretical value. So the more trials you do, the better your approximation is going to be, uh, is, is all that this law is saying. So this gives us uh, a way of interpreting what a probability means. It's an average in the long run. Probability doesn't tell us what's going to happen on any one trial of the random experiment, but it will tell us what will happen in the long run. And so let's uh, illustrate these ideas with a simple example. 
Uh, and this is an example that we're going to do in class. But uh, suppose we have a bag with four blue, three red, two green, and one yellow cube. And we're going to reach into that bag and randomly grab a cube. And we might ask, how likely is it that we get a green cube? Okay. Sounds like a reasonable question. So if we let G denote the event that we get a green cube, then in mathematical notation, we want to know the probability of G. So let's take a relative frequency approach. And to do that, what we might do is, is choose a cube, record its color, replace the cube, and repeat that 50 times. So let's say one student does this, and, and she gets 19 blue, 15 red, 12 green, and, and 4 yellow. And, uh, then to, to, and then she divides each one of those numbers by 50 to get those relative frequencies shown there in the right-hand column. So look there, the relative frequency of green is 0.24. So that tells us the probability of getting a green cube is about 0.24. Well, now let's suppose that a second student does the same thing. And uh, she gets 21 blue cubes, 16 red, 7 green, and 6 yellow. Okay? And the relative frequencies are shown there. So look at her relative frequency of green. That's only 0.14. Okay? It's kind of in the neighborhood of what student 1 got, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, and so this illustrates why a relative frequency approach can give us, at best, an estimate of the, of the theoretical probability. These two students got different results, very similar results, but, uh, but, but different. Okay? Now let's take a more theoretical approach to doing this problem. Now, in this case, here's our sample space, call it S, and it's the set, call it B1, B2, so on and so forth. So that means the first blue cube, the second blue cube, R1 is the first red cube, so on and so forth. So we see there that we have 10 elements in our sample space. Okay? Now, because we're randomly choosing a cube, all of those outcomes are equally likely. So that means the theoretical approach applies. And now let's let G be the event that we get a green cube. In mathematical notation, it's the set G1 and G2. So uh, n of s is 10, n of g is 2. So the probability of g is 2 over 10, which is 0.2. Okay, so there's our exact theoretical probability of getting a green cube. Now let's use the law of large numbers to combine the students' results and, um, and illustrate what this law of large numbers means. So for the two students together, they did a total of 100 trials, and they got a total of 19 green cubes. And so if we take those 19 green cubes that they got combined, divide it by the total number of 100 trials, we get 0.19. Now 0.19 is pretty close to 0.2, not exactly 0.2, but it's closer than either one of the students got individually. So that's what the law of large numbers means. You do more trials, your relative frequency is going to be closer to the theoretical probability. Okay. Uh, here's another example. Uh, let's suppose that we roll two fair six-sided dice and add the results. By fair, we mean that each side on each of the dice is equally likely. And let's let A denote the event that the sum is greater than 7. And we want to find the probability uh, that this event occurs. And so let's try, to, uh, let's try to describe our sample space in the form of a table here. And so across the top there, we get the result from the second die, 1, 2, up through 6. Across the, uh, the left-hand side, we get the result from the first die, 1 through 6. And then in the center, we get, we get the sum. So we see that our sum ranges from 2 uh, all the way up to 12. Okay. Now, A is the event that we get, um, that we get uh, greater than 7. And so if we count the number of those outcomes that are greater than 7, we see that there are 15 of them. And there are a total of 36 outcomes altogether. So we take 15 divided by 36 to get about 0.417. So there's the theoretical probability of getting a sum that is at least that is greater than 7. Now, next we're going to introduce an idea that we're going to talk a lot about starting in Chapter 2, and you're going to get really sick and tired of me saying this phrase. It's the idea of a random variable. Okay? So let's let the letter capital X denote the sum of the dice. Now, this is not an event. Uh, this is going to be a number. X is the sum of the dice. 
Okay? And this number is what we call a random variable. Uh, a random variable is just a way of associating a number with each outcome of a random experiment. Now, in this table here on the, the top row, we list the, out, the, the possible values of, cap, of x, and we denote those possible values by lowercase x. So they take values from 2 up through 12. Now, if we look back at that table from a couple of slides ago, we see that uh, in one outcome, x equals 2, in two outcomes, x equals 3, and so on and so forth. Okay. And then this last row, uh, we denote that p of x, this is going to be the probability that x equals uh, the value of little x from the top row. So the probability that x equals 2 is 1 over 36. The probability that x equals 3 is 2 over 36, so on and so forth. And this table we see here is called the distribution of the random variable x. The word distribution is something that we'll be talking a lot about starting in chapter 2. Now one last way of calculating probabilities is what we call subjective probabilities. And uh, here we, we estimate the probability by using knowledge of pertinent aspects of the situation. We're not going to repeat the experiment over and over again, uh, nor are we going to try to use a theoretical approach. We're simply going to um, try to estimate it using information about the situation. Okay. So uh, an example is we might ask the question, will it rain tomorrow? Well, we might be tempted to say that, that the sample space is either it's going to rain or it's not going to rain. There's only two outcomes. And let's let A be the event that it rains. So there's one element in that sample space, or one, there's one outcome in that event. And so then we might be tempted to say that, well, the probability of event A is 1 half because 1 over 2. We're using a theoretical approach. But there's a problem with that. The theoretical approach only uh, applies if all of the outcomes are equally likely. And it's not obvious that these two outcomes of rain and not rain are equally likely. So we can't apply the theoretical approach. Um, so then the question is, well, what is the probability that it's going to rain tomorrow? Well, the weather forecaster uses knowledge of weather and information from radar, satellites, etc. to estimate a likelihood that it will rain. So you may say it's, it's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow, but that's... Uh, that, that's not a theoretical probability, nor is it a relative frequency. It's just the, the, it's just kind of a best guess as to the likelihood that it's going to rain tomorrow. Now let's look at one last example of, of applying the theoretical approach, or at least a modified version of it. Let's suppose we randomly choose an integer between 1 and 100. So our sample space here is the numbers 1 up through 100. And let's let the event A be the event that we get a number 75, 76, all the way up to 100. So then we could calculate the probability of getting um, of that event A occurs by taking um, the number of elements in event A divided by the number of elements in the sample space. So that's 26 divided by 100, which is 0.26. Now here we're assuming that we randomly choose an integer so that every one of those integers is equally likely. And so we have a finite sample space, and so we can apply the theoretical approach here. But now let's uh, modify this a little bit. Let's suppose we randomly choose any number between 1 and 100. We're not going to limit ourselves to integers. And so in this case, our sample space is not the integers 1 up through 100, it's the interval 1 to 100. And let's let b be the interval 75 to 100. Okay? And we want to calculate the probability that event b is going to occur. Well, the, the relative, uh, the uh, theoretical approach doesn't apply here because our sample space is not finite. There's a, an infinite number of outcomes in our sample space. So we can't apply the theoretical approach. But we may say, well, it, it seems reasonable to assign a probability to event B by taking the length of that interval, dividing by the length of interval S. So in this case, the length of B is 25, and the length of S is 99. By simply taking the end point minus the starting point, we do that arithmetic, and we get 0.253.